Hello and welcome back for yet another side-by-side -side comparison. In the last video, we talked about the split sample comparison between two oat tests done on the same person, same pea sample, same day. So if you haven't checked out that video, go ahead and check it out now. Uh, in this video, we're going to be doing one more layer. We're going to be building on that conversation because we're going to be comparing the organic acids test from Great Plains Laboratory versus its closest competitor that I could think of at least, which is the NutriEval from Genova Diagnostics. Uh, I have used both of these over the years, to be clear. I don't use them with everybody. I don't think that everybody needs a big nutritional assessment in this, this way, but uh, on occasion, you know, handful of times a year maybe, I will run one or both of these tests uh, typically what I've done is I'll order the oat test if I'm more curious about yeast or oxalate, and I'll run the nutri eval if I'm more concerned about nutritional markers and nutritional adequacy. Uh, Genova did add oxalate to their nutri eval in the last year or two. So now I'm starting to gravitate more towards that and a little bit less towards the organic acids test. Um, but, you know, the question of the day today, the question in my mind was, can you use these tests interchangeably? Is one more valuable than the other? Um, and say like if, if you worked with one practitioner or if you had gotten a hold of one of these yourself, like say you ordered one of these through like directlabs.com. Um, if you had done one or two nutri evals and then you started working with a practitioner who then wanted you to do an oat, could you compare your before and after samples, or is it a lost cause? Similarly, if you had worked with somebody or if you had done them on your own, if you had done one or more oat tests, and then you worked with somebody who insisted on a nutri eval, could you track progress by comparing the samples to each other, or is it kind of a wash? Are we basically looking at a completely different beast? So let's get into it, and I will share with you uh, a little bit about these tests. I'll go to head bubble mode and scroll back up. So what I've got here is two oats and the nutri eval. Um, again, these are all my samples that I took for the sake of this experiment. Now, uh, I'm going to start us off with the yeast markers because honestly, that's probably why you're here. Uh, most, most of the people on my channel are most, most interested in these tests for the yeast reason. Um, but just know that there's a lot more to both of these tests. Hold on, I'm going to move my head bubble a little bit. Uh, so, all right, so here's a look at, uh, at both sides of this. So let's look first at the oat test and then we'll go, we'll go over to the nutri -Bell. So if you look at my, my two oat tests, you wouldn't be inclined to say that I'm totally overrun with yeast, right? Like maybe there's a little hint of candida judging by the arabinose here and here. But overall, most of my markers are well below the second standard deviation line. The majority of them are below the first standard deviation line uh, on both tests. So mostly you would say yeast is probably not a super big problem for me. I might have a little bit here or there. Uh, full disclosure, I took these samples, uh, I think it was the week after Thanksgiving or maybe the week after that. So I had definitely had some pie and some sugar. Uh, so maybe that was a piece of it too. But yeah, not, not a tremendous issue for me. And similarly, if you look at the yeast and fungal markers on the nutri eval here, you would likewise say the same thing. Like, all right, that arabinose is like really, 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 really borderline. It's like one point over the line into their yellow zone. But looking at this, you wouldn't think like, oh man, we super have to kill the yeast. Uh, looking at individual numbers... Uh, and again, they might have different ranges or they might be measuring things in different ways. So keep that in mind between these two tests. But if you look like d uh, that's going to be arabinose. And these numbers, so I go from 27 and 30 on the oat to 18 on Genova's test. Okay, so a little bit different, but not tremendously so. Uh, citromalic acid is up here, number one on the oat. 0 0.43, 0 0.64, uh, 2.0, basically the same. Uh, tartaric acid, number six on the oat, 
we could see 0 0.26, 0 0.26, and not detectable. So I got like a little bit of variation here or there, but overall it's basically the same picture that you're getting. So I think that the yeast markers are pretty consistent. We get a little bit of a different picture with the bacterial dysbiosis markers. So in particular, I'll draw your attention to DHPPA. So on the oat, uh, and here I'm going to scroll just a bit. Hold on. Okay, so DHPPA in the first oat is 0 0.09 versus 0 0.08, and then coming over here, 0.8. They're both normal. Neither of them are really concerning. But if you look, the oat test is saying that I'm on the lower end of the bell curve, if anything, like kind of middle ish lower end of the bell curve. Um, versus, well, yeah, I guess it's still the same, the same thing here, I suppose. All right, scratch that line of thought. I'm kind of uh, digesting this with you all again, as I talk about it here. So all right, DHPPA, different numbers, but same kind of clinical takeaway. Then we've got uh, hyperic acid, which is number 10 on the oat. So hyperic acid, we've got 146, 180, and below detectable limit. That's a little bit interesting. Because if you look, the top end of Genova's range goes up to 603. And the top end of the oats range goes up to 613. Um, and I believe when I looked this up, they are measuring these in the same way with the same um, measurements. So millimole per mole of creatinine. I believe I looked that up and it's the same for Genova. So I don't really understand how those two are so different. But yeah, it, it is what it is. Uh, we also have another marker here. We've got this uh, four hydroxyphenylalactic acid, the number 15, one of the clostridium markers on the oat. And we go from 7.4 to 8.3. And on the oat, 10. So again, Pretty, pretty much the same picture that we're painting on, on both tests, uh, with the exception of hyperic acid, which is quite different from one to the other, which I'm, I'm not sure I can explain. Uh, then moving on, I'll just point out some of the B vitamins. Again, I tend to lean on Genova more for the nutritional side of things, and I tend to think about uh, the oat a little bit less, in part because the NutriVal also does minerals, where this test does not. Uh, but if you were to look, so... The marker for vitamin B12, methylmalonic acid, 1.8 versus 1.7 versus 1.2. So pretty close. Um, it sounds like it's better on the NutriValve report, but either way, it's it's fine. Um, we've got, well, here, this is actually, this will be an easier visual to talk about it, probably. Uh, so here's this little summary page. This is like page two of the NutriValve report, and they give you this range of like, you know, high need in red, kind of medium need in yellow, and no need, you're doing great in green. And if you were to look back and forth, let's pull up one of the oats. So again, B12, I look pretty solid overall, like maybe a little bit low end of normal, according to the two oats, versus B12. Yeah, B12, they actually marked me in the yellow zone for that too. Not sure why, because a methylonic acid of 1.2 is really good, but that's all right. Um, so that's telling a similar tale. Uh, let's look at riboflavin, vitamin B2 on the two oats. And again, like higher end of the bell curve, higher end of the bell curve. So it's suggesting a slight nutritional need for vitamin B2 on the oats as well. So that lines up pretty well. Vitamin B7, biotin, also shows uh, some degree of need for biotin on the NutriVal versus on the oat, uh, I'm actually doing better than the average bear. So it indicates no need for biotin on the oat. I'm not sure which one to believe. Um, so take it for what it is. Uh, and then let's see, B6 was the other one. So B6, maybe I have a little bit of a need here, like I'm on the lower end of the bell curve. I, I'm being really nitpicky right now, by the way, just intentionally because of the nature of these videos. Um, but maybe it's showing a very slight nutritional need on the oat here and here. And B6, again, suggesting maybe slight nutritional need there as well. Uh, but like I said, B12, 
B2, B12, uh, CoQ10, which I haven't mentioned yet. CoQ10 looks great on, on all three of these tests. So those track well. I think overall, most of these are tracking pretty well with each other. Uh, vitamin C is another exception. The oat makes it look like vitamin C is horrendously low. The nutri valve said that I'm good. I'm, I'm good. But again, I have heard from the oat company, uh, Great Plains, when I took a class from them a few years back, they specifically said that the vitamin C measured on the oat is not a nutritional marker and it's very unstable in urine. So it cannot indicate uh, a nutritional need or adequacy of vitamin C. So, um, so maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, let's look now, a couple others that are on both tests. So pyruvate and lactate are seen up here. Let's see, line her up. So again, pyruvate and lactate, we've got lactate right in the middle of the bell curve, pyruvate maybe lower end of the bell curve or right in the middle. And if I scroll back up and down here, sorry, this will take a second. It's a beast of a thing. Uh, similarly, pyruvate and lactate both seen here under carbohydrate metabolism. Both of them are right about in the green. They're right in the middle of the bell curve. So uh, nothing too wonky on either of those. They seem to track well. Let's look now at the oxalate part because I had mentioned in the first video that glycolic acid, the second marker on the organic acids test for oxalate, uh, those two numbers were quite different from one to the other. And that had me scratching my head a little bit, wondering how, uh, how reliable that number is. And similarly, if we come up just a little smidge here, if we look at the oxalate part of the oat, which is at the top of the page now, uh, we go from, you know, normal, normal, normal to normal, high, normal between the two oats. And then we go high, high, normal on the nutri -eval. What's also curious is that they do specifically say here that all of these biomarkers are in millimole per mole of creatinine, which is exactly the way the oat measures it too. So these should be pretty darn close to each other. And if you look at the numbers for glyceric acid, the first one, we go from 2.3 to 3.6 to 14.6, which is quite different. Glycolic acid, we go from 85 to 122 to 47, which is quite different. And oxalate itself, we go from 33 to 42 to 17. So the numbers are pretty, pretty different. I I would say personally, clinically, I would not look at this as an apples to apples comparison anymore. I would say if you really want to compare and look at your progress, you have to compare the same test to itself rather than toggling back and forth between the two. Um, again, I don't know how many of you have ever done that or want to do that, but just for what it's worth. Um, and then last but not least, I will point out that uh, I have wondered for a while what is the most, most effective validated way for us to measure glutathione in the body and can we do so non-invasively with something like a urine test uh, so in the nutrient eval we've got uh, 1176 for whole blood glutathione which is pretty darn good um, let's see on one of the oats um, again, they're looking at an indirect measurement here in a urine sample, so it's a totally different ballpark. But you can see the asterisk. It says that if this marker was high, that would indicate a, a deficiency or a need for it. And we could see on both of my organic acids tests that, uh, if anything, it's on the lower end of the bell curve for this particular metabolite, which suggests that my glutathione is pretty good. So good, good, and good. So overall, it seems like the two track well for glutathione, even though they're measuring it and um, making, making claims about it in completely different ways. I think at least they track well with each other. So you could probably assess glutathione with either one. Um, and now I'll just give you a little bit of a tour of the nutri -eval for what it's worth, because again, I, I do think this is a nice test. I don't think that most of you need this probably, but um, in particular, people who have been on a really restricted diet for a long time, uh, vegans, vegetarians, keto people, hardcore paleo people, 
uh, low FODMAPers, like people who have been on a restricted diet for a long time, and I'm concerned about nutritional adequacy. Um, and frankly, just sometimes when people are not open-minded to changing their diet, and I want to convince them that nutritional change is needed, uh, sometimes this can shine a little bit of light on us on that. So I, I like this test for that reason. I order it maybe a few times a year. Um, so you could see they map it all out as far as, you know, carbs, fat, protein, metabolism, some uh, Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, metabolites here. I actually really like the visual that they give you here where they show you, you know, like lead, mercury, aluminum, the things that can block these pathways. So if you have a buildup of one metabolite, you could start to hypothesize why that might be. It also shows you really clearly what the cofactors are, which I like uh, to their credit give credit where credit is due. Uh, the oat does something fairly similar. Like they give you the nice little wheel and you can, you can kind of draw the Krebs cycle wheel, but they don't show you, um, they don't show you a visual of what can block each of these steps and what is needed for each of these steps to move forward. So I like the visual here. Like for example, you need iron and B12 for this enzyme to work. That might be really good to know if you if you see a pattern out here that indicates that step is not moving forward maybe the person is iron deficient right so it's nice to be reminded of that clinically um they measure a few different like antioxidants oxidative stress kind of markers so we've got coq10 and glutathione which i already mentioned but they also look at lipid peroxidases and this 8 ohdg marker so looking at different different ways to assess inflammation and oxidative stress, basically, which I think is kind of nice. I have not researched fully the quote unquote malabsorption markers. I don't know how validated they are and if they're truly indicative of bona fide malabsorption or not. So I would have to look into that a little bit more to speak on those. Um, a lot of these are, are the same things from the other page that I just showed you. Um, they have some toxin kind of a detox markers. Like I said, oxalate is new, relatively new. Here are those like inflammation, redox kind of reactions again. Uh, we've got, this is also kind of nice. They give you a nice breakdown of different amino acids. So you can get a ballpark of like, am I getting enough protein? Am I getting enough of different amino acids? Um, yeah, a handful of other things that I'll use on a case-by-case -case basis. Here's the other thing that I like it for. It gives you a really nice breakdown of omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-9s, MUFAs, PUFAs, the whole kit and caboodle. So you can really start looking at your fat balance, which I find really nice. And then they give you this nice visual so you can see, um, you know, what's doing what. So you can see arachidonic acid was pretty low for my sample, which I'm not going to cry about personally. Uh, but EP, uh, DHA and EPA, those are, are rock solid. Um, and then here's the last little bit. So we do get minerals on the nutrient eval where we wouldn't normally with an oat test. So I get to take a look at copper, magnesium, manganese, potassium, selenium, and zinc. And they also give you a couple of nutritional elements. I was a little bit horrified to see the arsenic popping up into the red. I'm going to actually have to look into that and figure out where that would be coming from. Um, but yeah, I think that overall, they're both nice tests. I think the Nutri-Eval is, is a little bit superior in my experience. I think that there's just a lot of really good information on the Nutri-Eval. The price point is relatively similar to the OAT. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but they're pretty close as far as a price comparison. Uh, but you just get a lot more information on the nutrient valve. The downsides are the nutrient valve requires blood and urine. So it's, it's kind of a two-day collection process. You do the urine sample, you have to freeze it, you bring the frozen pee with you to the lab, and then you get your blood drawn. So it's a little bit more uh, effort in that sense and a little bit more of a pain in your butt to get the collection done. Uh, the other thing is that it doesn't have as many yeast metabolites. Again, I don't know how valid and like validated and useful those metabolites truly are. I haven't done a PubMed deep dive on that topic quite yet. Again, if you comment down below that you really want me to do a video on that, that might get me off my butt to do it. Um, I'm a little bit apprehensive about the yeast metabolites. I don't know how validated they really are in truth. So I don't know if that's enough of a claim 
uh, claim to fame to make me order the oat more than the Nutrivel, but I have used both of these over the years. I think they're both fine tests. Um, I just have gradually moved away from a lot of functional testing over the years because I have seen issues with it or I have seen that it doesn't always give you the answers that you think or hope it will. So like I said, I don't think everybody on watching this video right now needs one of these tests, but if you've been on a restricted diet for a long time or if you are uh, not open-minded to making dietary changes and somebody in your life is suggesting that you need to make dietary changes, you could probably gather some useful information with one or, or the other of these tests. As always, I hope that this was helpful. I hope it wasn't too thick and nerdy. There's a, a time and a place for thick and nerdy, but there's also, you know, just to, to be really frank, you just want to get better and you want to feel better and live a normal life. So I hope that this is helpful information and usable information so that it can help you make the right decisions moving forward. I will see you for part three. The last layer to this equation, a shorter video, is where I talk about the measurements for glutathione. And what I did was I talked about the oat and the Nutri-Eval glutathione markers today. When I did this experiment, I also got blood drawn at LabCorp and I measured my glutathione in blood with LabCorp. So I have three different, uh, three different markers for, um, for glutathione. So I was going to say glucose. Uh, I have three different markers for glutathione. We'll talk about them and we'll talk a little bit about glutathione and why it's important, why it matters, how to support it in the next video. So stay tuned. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.